Welcome to the first episode of the second season of the Build Your People podcast with Kathy Hum. I'm your co-host, Jen DeWeese, and I'm also the president of the Maryland Center for Construction, Education, and Innovation, or MCCEI. At MCCEI, our mission is to inspire, educate, and connect a diverse population to careers in the built environment. We created the Build Your People podcast to help construction firms in their fight for talent. Recruiting and retention is our industry's biggest challenge, and we're here to help you tackle that every day. Let's listen. This episode is brought to you by our sponsor, Limbach. Limbach is a 123-year-old building systems solution firm that partners with building owners who have mission-critical mechanical, electrical, and plumbing infrastructure. They have an in-depth experience partnering with building owners primarily in six vertical markets, healthcare, data centers, industrial light manufacturing, cultural entertainment, higher education, and life science. Known for their extensive facility experience, local presence, financial stability, exceptional service, and innovative solutions, Limbach is a trusted partner to mission-critical facilities dedicated to exceeding expectations and helping their customers achieve their short and long-term facility goals. Welcome to the second episode of the second season of the Build Your People podcast with Kathy Hum. I'm your co-host, Jen DeWeese, and I'm also the president of the Maryland Center for Construction, Education, and Innovation, or MCCEI. Our mission is to inspire, educate, and connect a diverse population to careers in the built environment. With me, as always, is our podcast co-host, Kathy Hum. Hi, I'm Jen. HR. Hi. Kathy, you're HR professional and founder of NTP HR LLC. How are you today? I'm doing fantastic. How are you? Wonderful. Good. Uh, Kathy and I have two guests. We have TJ Hans and Keith Alton. Or nope, you're Keith Apton. <laughs> Let me start that over again. Kathy and I have two guests today, TJ Hans and Keith Apton. Gentlemen, please take a moment to introduce yourselves and give us a brief overview of your businesses and the services that you offer. TJ? Uh, my name is TJ Hans. Uh, my office is in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, we are a full service insurance uh, shop and we handle everything from um, business planning to uh, to your property and casualty uh, and protecting your home and auto. Thanks, Keith. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Keith Apton. I run a 12 person team out of Washington, D.C. Uh, the name of the company is called the Capital East Up Group and we help with business succession planning ESOP transactions, and I also run a family office helping individuals with you know, holistic tax estate planning and financial planning. Awesome. Nice to see you both. Today, we're going to be talking about succession planning, its importance, and what steps you should take to create one for your business. So last episode, we talked about strategic plans and how and why business owners need to effectively run their organizations. We talked about the idea that sometimes owners are so busy running their businesses that they don't take time to plan their business. And I would say that same can be said for the idea of what will happen to your business when it comes time for you to retire. Because I would imagine most people listening to this episode hope to retire someday. So today, TJ and Keith are going to talk to us today about why they've helped or how they've helped business owners plan for what happens next. So Kathy, can you explain to us um, the importance of a succession planning for businesses, especially when it comes to ensuring continuity and stability in the event of key personnel changes? Sure. I always tell my clients it's never too early to plan for succession. So often they're blindsided and they're ready to unload their business, sell it, and they haven't done any planning. So I think it's really important that businesses are looking out and projecting over the course of at least 10 years. What does my business look like in 10 years? Where am I going to be? Who are my successors? I always tell um, executive leadership team, find your replacement mm -hmm. and do a skills gap analysis. Do we have our replacements within the organization? Can we train up individuals within the organization? And in, in, Several cases you can't, so you have to look outside and make sure you have those people in line. If you're looking to, you know, sell your business or you have a family member that's going to, you know, take the seat of, take the helm and you're going to get out, 
that's where Keith and TJ will come into play where you have to do evaluation of your business and you have to understand the organization from profitability and all of that. So it's really important to start that process and it's never too early to um, start looking at that. Awesome. So say somebody, you know, we're going to get into the hows and whys, but what are like the primary components of a succession plan? Well, I would say Keith and, and TJ certainly chime in, but you do really need to understand what your structure looks like, where you want to go in um, the next five to 10 years, who you have within the organization, and then also do, do a formal valuation of your or organization. What's the value of it? What's your compensation and your profit structure look like? And really understand all of those nuances to be able to determine if you are going to sell it or you're going to have a family member move into the um, helm of, of, the, of the, the company. Or Keith will talk about ESOPs later. Maybe you want to convert your company into an ESOP, but all of those things really need to be dissected to figure out what's the best, best plan of action for your company. I think, Kathy, I agree with everything you said. Uh, in addition, I'd say, are you emotionally ready to sell? Mm -hmm. um, which is something that I think a lot of times overlooked. Uh, is your business attractive in the eyes of the buyer? Yeah. Um, so, so essentially, have you had somebody come in and address the blind spots and the things that essentially may have a black eye that you want to clean up before you go ahead and maximize value? And the third component is financially, are you in a position to sell? Mm -hmm. I think a lot of business owners and entrepreneurs, they're tired and they want to sell, but they haven't actually taken the time to recognize what life will look like when they lose the cookie jar of the business where they're able to st you know, stick their hand in the, the operating, the operations and the, the cash flows of the company to be able to fund the lifestyle. So the, the three things there, Kathy, that I'd add again are, are you emotionally ready to sell? Is the company financially prepared and does it look good in the eyes of the buyer? Is it ready to be sold? And have you actually done financial planning on the front end to make sure that you have enough set aside so that you're financially positioned to be able to sell? Mm -hmm. So nice. that kind of tees off my next question. You know, we've, Kathy, you've already said, like, there's no time, like, now's the time to start your succession planning. But like for a business owner that, you know, they have a million things to do on their plate, like what is, what, what would tell them? Right. These are all the factors that say this is now this is the time that you need to make a decision. Um, and when is too late to start planning that? And if it's not you, Kathy, Keith, uh, TJ, what are your guys thoughts? Keith, I think you're spot on. Go ahead and take that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Can you repeat the question, there, Jen? So like what when 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 you're trying to decide of all the things that you're doing as a business owner, when is like the last moment that you should be trying to this succession plan? Like how, how long is too late to wait? Yeah. I, I think that I think TJ and I were talking about this prior to this call. I, I think that you should, it's a continuous process. Mm -hmm. I, I think that you actually need to be thinking about succession planning as you're building your company. You know, how's the business going to operate? What if I get sick? Can the business continue to operate and take care of my clients, my customers? Obviously, it's an income stream for my family. How's it going to continue to operate if I already get sick and have to step away for a period of time? You know, so I think it's a, a continual process that as you're building and scaling, you really need to be setting your company up to be able to run without you. Check your ego at the door. You really want to advocate for your management team and make the business be able to operate and have a brand to be successful with or without you and be thinking about what is that number that I ultimately am looking to get to where I'm in a position to be able to decide, do I want to sell? So for me, it's a continuous process, um, but you never want to be in a scenario where you're reactively being forced to sell. Mm -hmm. You want to be in control of that process and you want to be in control of your timing because the more time you have and more options you have, the better you're going to be able to make the right decision for you, your family, the company, and your employees. Yeah, with, with regards to when is it too late, I, I just actually made a post about this, I think, last week. 
I'd sat down a few years ago with a restaurateur uh, in Ocean City, Maryland, uh, very success successful. He's been in business quite a while and I was literally sitting at his kitchen table and said, Rick, what happens to the restaurant when there's no more Rick? And he looked like I had, he'd been blindsided by a truck. Um, no one had ever thought to ask him the question. And and at, at uh, almost 70 years old, um, we were behind the eight ball when trying to get things uh, such as life insurance in place, mm. um, you know, you, you start facing uh, some difficulties at that age. Um, and also that that window from which you have to do any planning at all has, has drastically shortened itself. So I, I also want to throw in there with some of the smaller businesses, the CEO and president are wearing many hats and encouraging them to cross train and push down um, duties within the organization so that they are freed up. And as both TJ and Keith alluded to, that if they, if something were to happen to them, the business could run. Mm -hmm. Right. It's the working on your business instead of in your Rather business. Rather than in your and, business. And for a lot of these guys, it is extremely difficult to, yeah. to make that step of not having total control. Absolutely. I mean, I, I mean, I'm not, I'm a, run a nonprofit, not a small business, but I, I struggle with the same thing too. The idea of, well, just de delegation is a hard thing to do for some leaders. Uh, and, but it's incredibly important because you don't want your life's work to, to go away if you go away. Completely understand. All right. So Keith, um, I know we were talking before the call about one of the options um, would be an ESOP. Can you explain what that is to um, anyone listening and how they create a path to succession planning. Yeah, I mean, ESOPs in its simplest form are they're misunderstood, not understood, explained incorrectly. Um, so it's the, the acronym stands for Employee Stock Ownership Plan. Anytime I do any public speaking or teaching on, on the particular topic, I try to get away from Employee Stock Ownership Plan as quickly as I can because by nature, you would think that the employees are buying the stock and they own it. And the employees are not buying the stock and they don't own it. It's a retirement plan, and the employees essentially have a financial interest in the future growth of the company as plan participants. At the highest level, I think that ESOPs are flexible, tax-efficient exit strategies. They're flexible because it's an option as opposed to an outright sale for an owner. It's an option for a business owner or owners, plural, to sell some of their stock or all of their stock. So you can do a 5% sale, 10%, a 30%. So you can kind of leg into it, very flexible. It's flexible because an owner can decide how long he or she wants to stay active with the company. They're not being forced out by a buyer. At the same time, they can leave right away if there's a good management team. And they're highly tax efficient, Jen, for many reasons. They, they allow business owners under certain scenarios to defer with the right planning, completely avoid paying the capital gains tax under Section 1042. 100% uh, wholly owned S corps can operate tax exempt, which really helps the cash flows of the company. And then there are great tax benefits to the employees because the employees get a meaningful retirement as the company grows and it pays back the debt. The employees essentially become plan participants and they have a future retirement as they leave the company or the, the company will buy back or the ESOP will buy back their shares. And the last thing to leave you with is I call it an exit strategy because ESOP don't like sales are situations where owners don't get all their money at, at the close. So you've got to have fire in the belly to really run and run and operate and, and maintain some level of involvement and see this company really transition over time to the employees. Um, so at a very high level, to answer your question, that's what ESOPs are. And individuals look at these as alternatives, and that's the right way to view it, is, is an ESOP right or wrong for me? Well, it's not right or wrong. It would be wrong to not look at an ESOP as one of your options as you're exploring a dividend recap or a sale to a third party or doing nothing at all, transitioning the company to your kids or if you're large enough going public. It's just one of many options. And I think all clients should be looking at all the different options and evaluating the pros and cons of each of them. And Keith, you and I were talking a while ago about an ESOP is not for everyone. Oh, Kathy, it's it's an ESOP's not right for most a lot, of <laughs> a lot of people. So, um, yeah, you know, you know, when they work, they're great. 
Yeah. I mean, they're fantastic. Many of my best friends are in the ESOP community, but they've never seen a company that shouldn't be an ESOP, right? Okay. They're in the they're in the ESOP business. Um, you know, when they work, Kathy, they're beautiful. It's yeah. look, you can sell stock and you can get capital out and avoid a capital gains tax, and you can take care of the same employees that help you build wealth, and they're in your community and you're giving them wealth, and the company can continue to prosper, and that's great on paper. And those deals really do work when you have the right candidate. But to be the right candidate, Kathy. These are the five things I'm always looking for. And if you're not really going to meet these five, you kind of are starting to force a transaction. You need to step it aside, step aside. So one, these are tax efficient leverage buyouts and leverage buyout by nature means the company has to be profitable because it's going to be repaying debt to a bank or repaying debt to, to a seller. So you need a strong, profitable company with predictable earnings moving forward. That's one variable. Two, you need a company that doesn't have a lot of debt. Because if a company has a lot of debt, if they have current cash flow, they're paying down debt. So we're looking for good, healthy companies with good reoccurring cash flow with, without a lot of outstanding debt. That's a second variable. Third variable, we're typically looking for companies that have 30 employees or north. We can look at 20 to 30, Kathy, but anything fewer than 20 is tough. 500 employees is great. 1,000 is wonderful. But you really want to see 30 employees in north. And then the fourth and the fifth characteristics, we've talked about this earlier. The fourth one is you need a good management team because you're not bringing in a buyer, you're creating the buyer. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to create the buyer, if the entrepreneur is the business and they haven't built or worked on that succession plan or that management team, then really the company is going to fall apart because there's nobody there to run it. And the fifth and the last characteristic that leads into your question is, um, is it a good candidate? You know, ESOPs are not right for any, everybody. If you are burned out and you want to leave the company and you're looking for a check, and you want to pay taxes and retire, an ESOP's probably not the right fit because it's going to take you every bit of five, seven plus years mm -hmm. to be able to put that full per purchase price out. So in summary, again, what I left you with is the five characteristics we're looking for. Not to say these are the only five, are good cash flow, not a lot of debt, north of 30 employees, a good management team, and the last one is an owner that has fire in the belly, that recognizes this truly is an exit strategy, just not, not an outright sale. Great. There, I mean, I know that there are several general contractors in the Maryland area that that have ESOPs and I and they publicly mention it because they see that as a recruitment uh, strategy too for their employees um, as a way to gain wealth. I don't know how um, to a young person how like beneficial an ESOP sounds because it's not putting money in your pocket, like, you know, to help pay your bills, but um, it is helpful. I, I have advice on that. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's hard for individuals that are selling mm -hmm. to then be able to connect the owners, to connect with the employees and say, this is good for you. Right. Because to your point, Jen, you're spot on. And ESOP's a retirement benefit. It's not going to give you keys to the Cadillac tomorrow. You know, it's there to retain employees, enhance the culture and reward you when you retire with a meaningful benefit that's being given to the employees at no cost to them. But the reality is, I think it's it's better received when you have an outside third party that's able to come in there and in candor explain, here's what an ESOP is, here's how it works, and here's how it benefits you as a rank and file employee. And then stand there and be available to allow those employees to ask the questions I have found, Jen, there's a higher level of sincerity and buy-in from the employees when it's an outside third party that can come in and just explain it versus the owners that essentially there's always that doubt from the employees. Well, wait a second. You just did this. So this is good for you. Right. So I think it's important for the, employee, the owners to be present, but they should be present with a hired outside third party to be able to accurately explain and not overstate the benefit, but just explain to the employees how this thing works. So well, in our preps for this podcast, uh, TJ, you mentioned key man insurance uh, and that we know it's often mentioned in succession planning discussions. Can you elaborate on what that is and how it can mitigate risk for businesses during transition periods? Sure. So at, at it's very base. It's a life insurance policy um, that the business owns on a key employee, uh, someone who is valuable to the business. Um, to what end, uh, if that key employee were to, uh, 
become uh, disabled or God forbid die, um, or to leave the company, uh, depending on how the key man is structured, um, the insurance is there to fill those to fill those gaps. Um, it's not as grandiose or uh, necessary a retirement plan like an ESOP uh, operates on a kind of a much smaller level. Um, but but at its base, it's a life insurance policy. Uh, it can <clears throat> it can work uh, in situations where if you're a restaurant owner and you have a chef, if that chef were to leave, what is it going to cost the business to replace that key person? I just use that because I just mentioned the restaurant uh, tour. Um, what is the, what is it going to cost that business in perhaps lost uh, income if people stop coming to the restaurant because that chef is no longer the chef? The, the menu for some reason changes. Um, you have to be able to train someone to replace that person. And what that insurance does is pays the business the death benefit uh, in, in certain situations, or the business owner would also be able to take cash value um, out of the life insurance policy to fill those holes so that there is no interruption uh, in business while, those, while that succession is taking place. Okay, so this sounds like it might work for those people that didn't get their ducks in a row. Um, with... Quick, get a, an insurance plan. <laughs> <laughs> right, it could, it, could, it could certainly work for the people who didn't get their ducks in a row, but but also it, it, if, if you were going into business with somebody and for some reason you're not setting up a buy-sell agreement, which every single partnership should have, um, this can also be a way to kind of work around that. If if you and I are in business together and you're the widget guy and all of a sudden uh, you're gone, um, where where am I going to replace? Who am I going to replace you with? How am I going to find them? How much time is it going to take? How much is it going to cost? And that's when the insurance portion can step in and kind of fill that gap for the for the business okay. owner. So, it, I mean, even if you do have a contingency plan, it sounds like a beneficial um, insurance plan to have. Absolutely. So, Kathy, what would you say some of the common challenges or obstacles businesses face when implementing one of these succession plans? And I, I think the first and foremost is ownership buy-in. I, I go into clients and they're struggling with strategic planning and succession planning is a whole nother level. Mm -hmm. So getting them warmed up to the idea that it's never too soon to plan and then setting aside time to do it. I, I, I can venture to guess that TJ and Keith would, would agree that this takes countless hours to, you know, figure out it's not an overnight fix. And it takes time. So setting aside regular, regularly scheduled meetings to talk about succession planning is really important. Um, the other thing, too, that I think is important is the communication piece. The, you know, the workforce tend to create their own conspiracy theories of what's going to happen next. What if they sell? Do I have a job? And all of those crazy things. So um, come up with a communication plan. Change management is hard. And if you're selling the business, I had a client who was selling the business to a private equity, they got ahead of it. And they told the employees, we're selling to a private equity, but your job is safe. And here's why and here are the steps on how we're going to go about doing this so they got ahead of it and they were proactive change management is hard communicate the message be transparent um it, it's a lot you got to plan for it i mean transparency is so important in in culture for retention and whatnot could you imagine if especially if you're near retiring, retirement age or typical retirement age, and you haven't told your employees what's happening yet, you may lose employees who think, I have no idea what's happening to this business. I have this opportunity to go someplace that I know is a sure thing. And you may end up losing somebody as opposed to if you're just upfront and honest um, and let everybody know what your plans are. Um, uh, they say honesty is the best policy uh, for a reason. Kathy, on, on the heels of what you had said, I think the, the the primary reason that entrepreneurs and business owners don't do succession planning is is trust and control. Mm -hmm. And and so control is the obvious. It's entrepreneurs 
love having control. They're smart. Um, they're decisive. And they've been in control of their decision making. And there's never a great time for them to give that up. It's, it's what they do. And so the control aspect is just something you have to deal with. And you have to recognize as an owner that there is going to come a time when there's a new chapter in your life. And to be able to get that right comes with the succession planning and the pre-liquidity planning is what I like to say. So that's the control aspect. You got to give it up at some point. And then trust is tough. You know, to do succession planning, you're leaning on other people. And there's an element of distrust there mm -hmm. because individuals are going to charge them fees to help advise them. And so for me, the best way to break down that trust is don't lean on a person to help you with your succession plan. Be disciplined to get a team working in a coordinated effort. You should have your attorney, your CPA, your private wealth advisor, and your spouse and anybody else that you lean on, your insurance agent, together to brainstorm and code red. I call code red like everybody's channel checking for checks and balances, what everybody else is recommending. The trust no longer becomes an issue, Kathy. Why? Mm -hmm. Because the owner sitting in a room over a couple years, setting up their succession plan. And when they go to implement it, they've got the buy-in from their attorney, their wealth advisor, their spouse, their insurance agent, their CPA, everybody they lean on. And everybody has helped create the proper succession plan for them. So my advice to anybody listening to this is break down the barrier of trust by working with a team of individuals instead of an individual. It's a great point, Keith. That's a great point. So, Keith, um, can you share some examples of, you know, effective planning strategies and and how they've made a significant impact on a business transition process? Sure. And I'll tie it back to the ESOP. Um, you know, I've done this for 23 years. I've been fortunate to be part of a little over 300 of these transactions. So that's that's the one that'll resonate. And it came with proper succession planning. I call it the seesaw effect. I'll leave the company. Um, obviously confidential, but, you know, I had a, a client that, that had a really successful company and he enjoyed, you know, owning the company and he enjoyed having his name on the front door, he enjoyed bringing his kids into the business. And he understood all the perks as an entrepreneur that owning this company provided him. At the same time, he was tired. He was ready to retire. And he really actually needed the money out of the company that sold out of multiple for his own retirement. And it became a seesaw. It was, well, I need to sell so that I can step away and focus on myself and my spouse and enjoy our retirement. That was one half of the seesaw. The other half of the seesaw where it went like this is, but I don't want to sell because then I'm going to deprive my kids of the same wonderful lifestyle that I had. And my kids are in the company and I want them to be able to feel good in the community and have their name on the front door and be able to take the earnings out of the company. So there's this big tug of war. And the client was really struggling with this for a period of five years. And so we all got together. And again, it was lawyer, CPA, myself, and, 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 and really a spouse. And we came up with a solution that accomplished the perfect outcome, which was I went back to that flexibility of Visa. He ended up selling 49% of his stock and gifting 51% to the kids. Nice. So what happened? We got a valuation on the company. We did some pre-liquidity planning and we figured out from a Monte Carlo analysis and some wealth planning that our team helped them with is if you sold for 49% of the value of your company, is that going to be enough money for you to live off of comfortably in retirement? And it was. So what we did is we made a gift of 51% of the stock to his kids, got it out of his estate. Right. His kids now are on the board. His kids have full control of the company. At the same time, this individual was able to sell 49% of the stock have enough liquidity to exit the company and live that comfortable lifestyle that he deserved while the kids still have full control of the company. And they may or may not sell their stock to, a late, to the ESOP at a later point in time or just sell it outright. That's the decision that they can make that's right for them, the company, and the employees in the future. Smart. Now, not everyone has kids to gift a company to. So um, TJ, you mentioned earlier buy-sell agreements. Can you explain what that is um, and how that could be a benefit um, a, a succession plan strategy? Sure. So so I will. And then I'll also tie in a story where I, I think 
we, we have all talked about how this takes time. It takes time to get these things together. It takes time to get the valuation. It takes time to get everybody on the same page. Um, at my former firm, we were working with uh, two architects to do a buy-sell agreement. They were two partners. Um, and generally in a buy-sell agreement, there are several ways that they can be structured, whether it's cross-purchase um, or entity purchase. Um, we were setting up a cross-purchase with these two individuals. Uh, both were married with kids. Um, both were approaching 50 years old. The business was close to 10. And we had been introduced to these guys through uh, a CPA. And uh, we were working with their attorneys. We were setting up the buy-sell agreement so that if, God forbid, something were to happen to uh, one of the partners, the other partner would be able to uh, buy out the shares from the, others, from the other's wife, because in Maryland, that's just how that works. Um, we got the attorneys on board. We had the CPA in the room. We knew how much the company was valued at. The, the point of contention was the type of insurance that was going to be used to fund the buy-sell agreement. Was it going to be permanent or was it going to be term? Uh, knowing that they were eventually going to sell the company uh, at, at hopefully a profit, um, and they weren't sure if the uh, the monetary contribution to a permanent policy was going to be the right fit for them. This conversation went on for 16 months. Uh, at that time, one of the partners uh, unloaded uh, his groceries from his car, uh, went in, sat down on his couch, and never got back up. Um, and that is kind of, yes, these things take time, but if we don't implement them uh, and, and we, we sit on the fence with them, then bad things do happen. And that's why the, we set these things up in the first place. Mm -hmm. uh, the other partner uh, could not keep the business afloat. Um, so there was some, a lot of downsizing that was done. And uh, and to be quite honest with you, I, I'm not sure if, if he is still running that business or not. Um, but but those are, the, that's the other side of it. That's what happens if you don't, if the decisions aren't made, even though everyone's on the same page and the time has been taken for the valuations and and it's, it's the unexpected. And that's why this, that's why we do this planning because not everyone unfortunately makes it to 65 to 70 years old to sell their business for profit and live the next 25, 30 years of their life you know, it, on, on the sand under palm trees, uh, wherever retirement looks like for the, the individual. So, um, but but a buy-sell agreement, back to that point, at, at, at its very base, it protects the partner in, in a partnership, um, basically from from any, any sort of the disability or, or death, God forbid. Um, quickly, we don't have to get too in depth to any other options, Keith, but besides, you know, key man insurance, buy sell agreements, ESOPs, uh, are there any other strategies for succession that you think are worth mentioning? Yeah. Um, one that people don't talk about a lot is doing nothing, meaning running the company. I mean, it should be by design and by choice. I would say that that's a poor option to just kind of fall into, but you can obviously run the company and and set up a management team and become a passive owner and just take your distributions where you compensate people properly. Some owners like that because they look at that as an income stream that's far greater than they could get off of real estate or the market. There's a management buyout where your management team is able to cobble up their own money through leveraging up their balance sheets in the company to be able to buy out the owner. There's a dividend recap where the company will essentially borrow money from a bank and make a dividend payment to the owner. There is a sale to a financial buyer, which is often called private equity. Mm -hmm. It's something that's going to come in there and buy the company. And then there's a sale to a strategic buyer, which is somebody in the same sector where you're ultimately going to get the highest purchase price, but at the expense of them coming in, paying that premium, because they're going to get rid of your HR, your mm -hmm. CFO, CEO, your president, because it's duplication of, you know, the executive management team. And then the last option that, that people have, if the company's large enough, is going through the rigorous process of filing S-1s and doing the roadshow to go public. So you have everything from doing nothing 
to a management buyout, to an ESOP, to a sale to private equity, to a sale to a strategic buyer, to going public. And, and as I said earlier, what's really nice is if you have time and you set aside the right amount of time, depending on the size of your company, the owner should be in control of figuring out what the right succession plan is for them because they've evaluated the pros and cons of all the options I just laid out for them. I um, actually worked for a company that was um, purchased by a strategic buyer with the insur assurance that everyone would still have jobs and they did not have jobs. Um, in fact, I was one of the layoffs, but you know, it, it that's, that's what happens. Um, you can't, not, none of these are guarantees that your business is going to stay on the same. So I guess it's just mitigating risk and, and making a decision and hopefully not before it's too late um, to make that decision. Keith, you mentioned do nothing and just kind of ride off the, have a good management team and ride off the profits of your organization. I think it's really important when we're talking about succession planning is making sure you develop that management team. I work for a company where they were in their 50s and 60s and they had no 40 somethings. They had 30 somethings. And so they created a management program. It was a three to five year management program and the individuals rotated in that program throughout the organization from insurance and bonding to HR and all the functions of how a business operates. And then they were able to identify their leadership team that way, but it took a long time. So definitely planning for who is that management team. Another thing that came to mind when, when during this conversation was when you, you are an owner and you have family members that aren't the right fit, they're working in the business, but they're not the right fit to take over the business. Just kind of wanted to throw out that and see what your thoughts were, because I run into that as well, where owners are struggling, like, oh, I've got my family members in here, but they're not quite ready. And I've got to go in five years. Yeah, I think I think the the right answer there is to have the difficult conversation, mm -hmm. but it's the right decision if your priority is sustainability of the company that you built. Because companies are successful due to human beings. It's not the service or the widget that you're selling. It's the human beings that are actually running the company. And if you have your kids in there, the primary reason a lot of times they have kids in their cap is is the influence they can have in the community, the influence on the board. The, the fun that comes with running a company. Um, and you can find different positions for them that have positions of power, but also positions of distributions of the wealth. But you don't have to make them the president or CEO. I mean, the individuals that are essentially running the company, president, CEO, CFO, they really need to be the right human beings, mm -hmm. not the right individuals that just came from lineage or family. And, and I want to go back to your comment earlier to make sure I don't fail the audience with succession planning. When I talked about doing nothing, meaning running the company and clipping coupon, to your point, that comes with intent of planning, of setting that up. And something that we, we talk to clients about is, how are you gonna be able to do it? Well, you can't do that if you don't pay people properly. So what we have a lot of our clients do, if they have the company and they've grown management and they wanna have this passive income stream or they don't wanna sell it, they oftentimes put in a form of, non-qualified deferred compensation, mm -hmm. synthetic equity, phantom stock, stock appreciation rights, management incentive plans. These are all acronyms that people in the financial services like to throw out. In its simplest form, form to just kind of um, simplify the, the concept, it's, all right, I own a company today. I want to step away. The company today is worth X. Let's just say it's worth $20 million. It's my business, but I want to have these individuals run it. So I'm going to create an equity incentive plan that says for every dollar above today's value of $20 million, I'm going to give my management team 25% of all future growth. What that does is it really provides the safety net of giving them the incentive capital mm -hmm. to stay with the company. Mm -hmm. They are incentivized because they're going to get an uncapped future participation in all the growth of the company which really protects the family that's looking to develop their succession plan of having that company continue to operate because you're properly incentivizing, rewarding, and paying the management team to continue to run a profitable company. So there's all different forms of way to do that. It's, it's not that one way is the right way, 
But again, it goes back to planning. Mm -hmm. Is yeah. to really align future profitability of the company with the exiting family um, to make sure the company remains sustainable. And you really have to get the experts like yourself, Keith and, and TJ, you know, to, to really understand what the options are. You can't do this in a vacuum. So we've success, we've planned our, you know, chosen our succession plan strategy, but we still have 30 years before we plan to retire. We are rocking and rolling with this strategy. TJ, I know we talked earlier that like any plan, um, they should be periodically reviewed and adjusted. Like what are what are the processes in which or or Keith, either one of you up uh, to remain relevant and effective with this plan strategy? We sit down with, and I'm sure Keith has, Keith does this as well. We sit down annually with our business owners to assess everything, not just the succession plan, but to make sure we're on track with everything that that we're doing. And and if that's done, and we're talking 30 years out, we have some time. Um, but as long as long as we're staying touch, and as long as we are keeping everything updated, and we know what's going on. And if you are building that management team. Um, or are you starting now? Are like where are those people coming from? I guess who's who's next up in line? What's going to happen over the next thirty years that is going to get you to the place where you want to go? Or if that's ten years or five, um, and just continually monitoring mm -hmm. and adjusting uh, the plan uh, so that it is it, so that the business owner can stay laser focused on the on the end game. Well, I know in the interest of time, does anybody have any final thoughts on what we need? Or if you, one piece of advice to a business owner that we haven't covered yet. Take the time to get to know your advisors. Uh, ask for references. Mm -hmm. Make sure that you actually see that they're competent, but equally as important as competent that you enjoy working with them and make sure that they're going to work in a coordinated effort with all of your advisors. That's the best advice I can share with any business owner. You need to have a succession plan. It's a village of people that you're going to work with. You're going to be working with them for several years, and you're going to want them to play nice in the sandbox together. So take your time to build and assemble that team. But it is a team effort. And I can't reiterate enough. Just communicate often. You know, have your town hall meetings regularly and when the timing is is appropriate let let people know what what the plan is whether it's strategic planning or succession planning they want to know and they want to be a part of it and they also want to know what what's in it for me what you know do i have a job am i going to get laid off what's going to happen to me so it's important communication is big huge right tj any words wisdom it, the the best time to start planning is today mm -hmm. so it's you know the the, so, the sooner you get it done and and I, I think the major objection that i get is people don't even know where to start um or how to start um but reaching out to a financial professional whether it's your fa whether that uh, is your cpa or your your attorneys or uh, your insurance professional, whatever that looks like, to ask the question and 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 get started. Because yeah. one of us, if we don't know the answer, will certainly point you to someone who does. Yeah, start with the your most trusted professional, right? Who do you have the best relationship with, and whose advice do you do you trust? It's great. Sure. Well, I want to thank you all for joining us today, and thanks to all our listeners for listening to the Build Your People podcast. We hope you enjoyed our second episode of season two, uh, as we continue to tackle the construction industry's biggest HR issues. So now you've created and implemented a succession plan for your organization so you can actually retire. Join us ne next episode while we discuss this super fun topic of con compliance law. <laughs> <laughs> if any of our listeners have a topic or question they'd like us to cover, please share them in the comments. Please check out all the links and resources in the show notes and follow us on social media. That's all for this episode, folks. See you next time.